Right, so um, we should get started. Th thank you for coming back to stay uh, for the final uh, session of the conference. So um, we have many other experts uh, to talk about the event from um, many disciplinary perspectives, sociology, political science, religion, and others. Um, now it's a uh, lawyer's turn. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the, because uh, the, the uh, protest started with a law, aggravated by a law, and um, one way or another will end with another law. So here we go. Um, this is supposed to be a, a, a dialogue panel. So this is how we structured the, the session of... Um, uh, two leading lawyers from the community, two senior uh, professors from the law faculty, and the four students. Um, two PhD students, uh, one LB and one JD. Um, I, I will introduce uh, 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 the speakers uh, uh, very briefly, shortly. But let me just... Uh, um, begin by saying that um, the university and the faculty have been doing dialogue for many months. Um, so the term started yesterday and the university is organizing uh, a, a, a series of dialogue uh, sessions in the university. There will be university level dialogue, there will be inter-faculty dialogue, there will be uh, faculty-based dialogue. So, the, so this one is the beginning of beginning of a long series of dialogues to be held on campus. Um, we, we are a, a small institution in the larger society. Um, there are things that are within our control. There are things that are beyond our control. But as a responsive member of the community, we do our best to manage the uh, uh, the political movement. Um, so, so what uh, we have decided to do in this panel is to divide the uh, session into uh, three parts. First, I will invite our two uh, lawyers from our community to make an opening speech, uh, three to five minutes each. That's the first part. The second part will be a dialogue among the members in the panel. The uh, students have prepared uh, a number of questions. We have grouped the questions uh, together, and they will ask questions uh, separately. And then uh, the other members uh, uh, on the panel would uh, answer the questions. Um, depends on how we proceed. Uh, I'm not very good at um, time management. The whatever time uh, that would uh, uh, be left will be the uh, Q and A in the traditional fashion. Hopefully, we have uh, adequate time for for discussion in this panel. Um, we have uh, eight. Uh, persons on the panel, uh, let me just introduce them very briefly. Uh, the first uh, speaker is um, uh, Anna Wu. Anna doesn't require any introduction. She's the com chairman of the Competition Commission, and she had a very long uh, uh, record of public service. Uh, she was a legislative council member, chairman of uh, EOC, Chairman, uh, chairperson of a consumer council, chairperson of operational uh, operations review commission committee of the ICAC. Uh, she was a member of the uh, EXCO, and um, most importantly, she is one of our graduates. So, uh, I'm a senior. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, the second speaker is uh, Mr. Jet Sotong. Is a senior counsel and uh, also has done this list of public um, service. Uh, two of the 
very important post he held as uh, chairman of uh, IPCC. I guess uh, anyone has any question about operation of the complaints, you, you have um, a good, uh, good source. Uh, he also was the chairman of the minimum wage uh, uh, commission. Um, my own uh, two colleagues are uh, Professor Samin Yang, um, he is the associate dean for research in the faculty. Professor uh, uh, Yap Po Jim is uh, Professor Floor is also the director of the CCPL, who is uh, responsible for this uh, event. The four students are Adrian Nam, PhD uh, in law candidates, uh, Lord Jiajun, PhD in law candidates, Joanna Wang, JD candidates, uh, Aaron Yam, ALB candidates. So without further ado, may I invite uh, uh, Anna to make an uh, opening speech. This one? Yes. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. And I know that we're supposed to be very brief. So I'd simply like to say that we've been living through a roller coaster kind of life, punctuated by protests. And if we look back uh, in terms of our recent past, 2003, we have the protests on uh, national security law. 2012, we have the uh, mandatory national education. 2014, the uh, Occupy Central. 2016, the Fishbowl Revolution, as you recall, relating to hawkers. And 2019, all hell broke loose. The grievances got bigger and deeper. And what I'd like to focus on is really three points. One is uh, seeking truth. The second one is healing rifts. And the third one is building a common destiny. As seeking truth is obvious. And that's the reason for a lot of people suggesting that we should have an independent commission of inquiry. In fact, this is one of the very basic obligations and a primary obligation of all governments, and that is to investigate what happened. And you really can't get away with that because uh, if we get the facts right, we probably will be able to achieve better closure. If we don't have this at all, I don't see how we could achieve closure. And if we look back at the protests, you could work out in your own mind what achieved closure and what didn't. Uh, in fact, from 1966 on, we've had about 13 commissions of inquiries. Uh, the first one with the commission on the Kowloon disturbances that occurred in 1966. The inquiry report did not come until 1967. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is of course, amnesty. And that is not just needed for healing rifts. It is also very much needed to form part of the peace-building exercise. It's a prelude to that and is usually accompanied by other steps such as reform. Uh, in all the peace-building exercises that I've come across, roughly half of them had this component on amnesty. And in 1977, of course, we exercised amnesty in favor of the police force on corruption-related offenses. Uh, and this is something that is considered by some to be against the rule of law. I think we can, uh, we can say quite safely that it is not because there is a public interest angle involved and there is discretion given to the Secretary for Justice to not to prosecute. Uh, the third one is really uh, peace building. Peace and stability can only be built on the basis of common identity, common destiny. And right now, I think we have a huge issue, and that is, what do we do with 2047? I sense a lot of frustration, a lot of despair on the part, in particular, of a younger sector. And we need to lift that perception of our shelf life expiring in 2047 and start to reform. And to undertake that sort of dialogue, we really need to look at the common underlying interests of all and to craft uh, a higher common value. This is possible 
uh, as it had happened in other places. And we did somewhat of that on a very smaller scale uh, when I was dealing with the national education issue. Uh, lawyers, mediators, negotiators are in fact trained to do that. And so this is where I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to uh, listen to me. Um, reason, the, the recent social movements, I'll just call it social movements now, really does pose perhaps the unprecedented challenge to the rule of law in Hong Kong. Uh, certainly the most serious threat to the rule of law, at least since the uh, handover. But naturally, uh, it's uh, of serious concern to all lawyers, and by lawyers I include law students as well, who, because um, many of you, I would assume, would aspire to join the legal profession uh, or even join the judiciary uh, in due course. So I group all, all, all of us together a as lawyers. And, and in face of the uh, recent events, both fundamental questions are being raised, such as how do we restore law and order, given what has been happening, how do we ensure the rule of law uh, is upheld in Hong Kong? And as uh, Anna has mentioned, what sort of society, what sort of legal system that we expect come 2047? And what can we as lawyers uh, do? Now, I do not profess to be able to answer any or all of these questions. Each of you may have different uh, answers or ideas. And I would uh, just at this stage offer some very brief observations of my own. Uh, more by way of introduction to kickstart the discussions with the panelists uh, and the audience uh, than anything else. Uh, the first thing that I would want to observe is probably something that is at the top of everybody's mind, is that the acts of violence, disturbances, must stop. And we must get back to normality in terms of uh, uh, societal uh, uh, peacefulness uh, in order to enable rational dialogue uh, to resolve the current crisis and forge a way forward. And by violence, I have to emphasize, I refer to all acts of violence on all sides. I'm not saying that there, is a, there should be violence, violence should be condemned on one side, <clears throat> whether it's the police or the protesters, and I use that word protesters in a, in a general sense. I certainly would urge the government to take the lead. I've been discussing with some other friends before we started, and it is... Um, if I may say so, quite disappointing, put it that way, very mildly, that the government really hasn't been doing very much uh, to bring about any meaningful, useful dialogue. But I think as a government, it has the obligation proactively to create a workable solution for all. That's what government is supposed to be for. And the, only then can we meaningfully talk about really the way forward. Now, the topic that I was given, or rather the, 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 the title that will be given for this discussion is the way forward. And uh, I would propose to raise two points from a perhaps slightly different perspective from what you may be expecting uh, to our discussion tonight, uh, but from the legal uh, point of view. Uh, firstly, um, mention has been made of one country, two system. Right? Uh, Article 5 of the basic law promises to us that the capitalist, capitalist system and our way of life shall remain unchanged for 50 years. And one country, two system, uh, under that, sort, that umbrella, doesn't seem to have worked very well 22 years after the reunification. And how to make it work, not just for the remainder of the 50 years, but hopefully beyond, uh, is important to Hong Kong. Uh, to make that work, uh, in a way, we must all recognize that Hong Kong is an integral part of China. And provoking China is not going to bring us any benefit. We must know our place. I think Hong Kong SAR is valuable to China only if we maintain our advantage. And one of the most significant advantages that Hong Kong has and has always enjoyed is the rule of law. And indeed, one may even say is precisely the lack of faith in the Chinese legal system uh, that triggered the current events in the first place because of the law. Uh, the extradition, extradition law. So we must be vigilant in upholding the rule of law, and lawyers, including those aspiring to be lawyers, uh, we must do everything we could to strengthen the rule of law and ensure that it is uh, in place and in a good health. 
we must not, I emphasize, we must not press the self-destruct button and begin to doubt the courts and judges, to doubt their independence and impartiality. At the same time, please, I would urge everybody not to abuse the court system for their political gain. And that applies to the government or those with different political views to the government. And I say that to all sides. A second observation that I have at this early stage is to pose a question uh, for the audience, and in particular, law students. That is, what role we as a special administrator of China should play in the greater scheme of things. That is, do we want to be part of China's development? China is a global economic giant, and whatever we do, it is going to stride ahead. It is going to, it is going to play an increasingly active part in world affairs and its own economic development. Do we want to take part in that, or do we simply want to stay where we are and possibly risk being ignored? And make no mistake, if we do not seek to play an active role in the country's development, uh, we will be ignored. And the Bay Area concept, for example, is the most vivid warning that we will be surpassed or sidelined unless we take advantage of the opportunities open to us. I often say to, to my friends that China can dispense with Hong Kong if necessary, but Hong Kong cannot dispense with Hong Kong. This is all we have. We as people of Hong Kong, this is all we have. Then the political reality, that political reality, is unlikely to change for a very long time. So as lawyers, when we say look forward, we should ask what role do we want to play in the future development of Hong Kong and the country? And perhaps more specifically for today's discussion, as aspiring lawyers and, and lawyers who have been practiced, we should ask ourselves what role do I play in the current and in the future legal system? And what is my role in the wider community as well as a lawyer? And think, uh, uh, you must all think hard about what role you should play uh, as a lawyer and how to make yourself relevant uh, in these fast-changing and uncertain times. And that is uh, my opening remark for the way forward for all of us. Hopefully there will be some discussion along those lines. Thank you very much. Thank you for the sobering comment, uh, comments. So let's uh, start with the questions. Uh, uh, given the time we have, I would uh, uh, invite the first uh, two questions. Uh, Adrian. Ah, thank you. So it's my honor to be here to ask questions on behalf of the law students. So as a law student, we have been told that courts and judges should stay politically neutral when judging cases. They should rule uh, on legal limits and to free from the interference from uh, uh, the government uh, and also the po uh, popular views among the society. So my first question would be, uh, during this turbulent moment, how Hong Kong courts can withstand the pressure uh, coming from the different sides, for example, the Chinese government and the Hong Kong society. And also, what role should courts take during this moment? So, thank you. Um, Aaron? Good evening, everyone. Um, my question is rather technical. And um, it, I want to focus on the judgment by the Court of First Instance on the anti-mass law judgment, which is uh, basically on two issues. The first one is about the Yao constitutionality. The other one is about mainly the uh, proportionality uh, of the um, PFCR. So uh, maybe we can discuss on this question. Thank you. Anyone wants uh, to start before Rudy? I can start on the judgment. Okay. Sure. Uh, but does anybody want to answer? Okay. Okay. So uh, there were a couple of major findings made by the court. And the first finding was that ERO, in so far as it's imposed on the ground public danger, it was unconstitutional. And on that ground, I completely agree with the court. And let me just read out a small paragraph that summarizes the court's reasoning on this issue. It says, in so far as the public danger ground is concerned, the ERO is so wide in scope the conferment of power so complete, its conditions for invocation so uncertain and subjective, 
and the regulations made there under investor with such primacy and the control of the latch code so precarious that we believe it is not compatible with the basic law. I agree completely with this finding. However, where I find it puzzling about this judgment was how it applied so far as the facial covering regulation for the purposes of unlawful assemblies. So unlawful assemblies are assemblies which are illegal or it was authorized then there were violence or breach of peace. And on that ground, the court actually, actually held that the restrictions were proportionate, i.e. it was compatible with constitutional rights to have such a law. However, interestingly, I thought, the court did not want to issue a suspension order to allow for this particular clause to be enforced, even though the court agreed that it was proportionate and compatible with constitutional rights. So for, for that, the second ground, I found it a bit puzzling. Actually, I don't have much to add, um, but I will say that in terms of the judiciary, I think the best advocates are the speeches made during the opening of the legal year. Uh, and I think the best way to move forward is to allow them to do their job the same way that they have done so in the past, and that is independent. Um, what I would like to raise is this issue, which is a bigger issue. It's not just an issue relating to anti-mask in the Hong Kong courts. But before 1997, some of our older folks, some of us like myself, um, had raised the issue of a constitutional court to arbitrate between the conflicts. And that was actually turned down by the British government when I asked for it. And the reason they gave to me then was that Hong Kong would lose because they felt that a constitutional court would not have enough of a balance. That's basically the message I got. But in theory, it's not a federal government uh, in so far as the role of Hong Kong is concerned. We're actually a subordinate government. And therefore, in theory, a constitutional court would not generally occur in that kind of context. But I think Albert, I saw Albert here earlier on. I think it would be helpful. Oh, right. I, I think it would actually be helpful for the Basic Law Advisory Committee to take a more active and transparent role. That if there is an issue put before them, it would be helpful to build up jurisprudence by uh, giving out the reasoning of some of the deliberations. So that's a part that I want to raise. At a uh, small point, um, the uh, appeal against the judgment has already been heard, and judgment is pending. Um, I'm not going to add my tuppence worth into that debate for the time being. I suspect that it's going to go to the CFA anyway, and I'm going to have lunch with two of those or three of the judges on Thursday, so I better not say anything now. Uh, we have a retired judge, high court judge in the audience. Um, I have served nine years as a recorder of the High Court. That was during that time considered to be a permanent appointment, so I was a member of the judiciary during that time. Um, I'm going to deputize again this year uh, at the request of the, of the judiciary. But what the point is that we know that judges in Hong Kong do discharge their duties diligently without fear of favor and impartially. That is important. And judges, I can assure you, they all have that same uh, conviction that they will serve their duty and adhere to their judicial oath uh, to decide the cases on the basis of the law without regard to possible political, social, or economic consequences of their decisions if they believe that it is correct uh, as a matter of law. And it is very important that we respect that and support our judges in discharging their duties in that way and do not even begin to doubt impartiality and uh, the independence of the individual judges just because the outcome of the judgment is not what you want, either from the political or other uh, ideas that you support. So uh, I would simply add that uh, insofar as our court systems are concerned, we have been doing 
we have been acting independently uh, as always. And even recently, when questions about uh, independence of the judiciary uh, has been raised in the, inter in the international community, Lord Panic, who is a member of the House of Lords in the UK, actually stood up uh, in the House of Lords debate and said that he, as being a frequent visitor to our courts, can himself testify that, that the lack of impartiality or influence from China is not his personal experience. And it is important that what we ourselves have faith in our judges, have faith in our courts. Let me just add, I agree with everything that's been said here. So on the questions uh, that Adrian's asked about rule of law and the pressure on the courts, um, I think one has to sort of put this in, in, in context. Uh, I mean, really, you're really talking about politically sensitive cases. And, and you're very, it's very rare for a judge, whether or a magistrate, to, to actually deal with a politically sensitive case. And yet we, we sort of, because it's so interesting and, and it's so important that we all focus on that and we tend to think that that has put, uh, caused a lot of pressure on the judges. But frankly, I mean, if judges, if they feel pressure, it's probably from the workload, uh, if anything. Uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of the more practical things that may bring that causes pressure rather than the political sensitive things. But as, uh, as Jad has, uh, has said earlier, you know, uh, judges, who, where do judges come from? Well, they come mostly from practitioners. And when pra practitioners work on cases, um, you know, they focus on what is relevant. And uh, in, even in politically sensitive cases, uh, there's enough uh, law, whether from Hong Kong, basic law jurisprudence is now, you know, uh, quite plentiful, but particularly comparative law. There's enough comparative law that can keep you busy and focused on what are the relevant issues uh, that um, you know you don't you won't you know drift off to, to consider uh, other irrelevant considerations uh, in adjudication. We see that in how cases are prepared and argued, and similarly in, in how cases are adjudicated upon. Um, let me just uh, comment very briefly on the anti-mass law. I'm not as optimistic as my colleague Po Jen that uh, all of the uh, judgment will be upheld. Um, I think if the most vulnerable parts will probably be the very first issue, which is uh, the uh, Legislative Council's power to make uh, regulations pursuant to the head of public order. I mean, I think there's a good argument to be made that the government should have some leeway uh, in, in, in uh, just determining what is or is not a public danger. Uh, and then uh, and then making regulations accordingly. Um, so I haven't written about it or looked at it that closely, but I just think that, that issue, if compared to the other issues, might well be overturned. Uh, but I think the other issues, I, I generally agree with the court on, uh, on uh, uh, in terms of the human rights uh, problems with uh, the regulations themselves. I just want to add one point because the rule of law and independence of the judiciary, they are not just judges' issues, they are everybody's issues. And one aspect of the rule of law comes through in the context of lawmaking. If we make bad laws, we are confining the judiciary's ability to function. So the prelude to all of that is good laws, good lawmaking, and good governance. Thank you. So, so the institutions of rule of law, judicial independence, are, are still with us, but they may be more fragile than we would be expecting. So, uh, Adrian, Aaron, anything to add? Uh, I'm asking the question about uh, court uh, impartiality because some of my friends who are not law students uh, uh, seems to be have uh, lose faith on uh, our judges and also the courts and as law students I try to persuade uh, like all the professions and uh, professionals and uh, scholars here try to tell them to have faith you know in our judges and to have faith uh, in Hong Kong's rule of law and I believe this is what we as students can do at this moment uh, yes uh, rule of law actually hinges a lot on uh, public's understanding and respect for it. So uh, I'm also here to take the chance to, uh, 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 happy to know that uh, professionals are also very optimistic about this. Um, I have just a very, you know, uh, mild 
opinion on it because I, I absolutely agree with Ms. Wu that it ha uh, no matter how uh, independent the judiciary is or the judges are when they are when they are ruling on some cases, there are many um, political or legal you know uh, ties. I would say so. I would say in many circumstances, the judges, the hands of the judges are tied. For example, in the basic law, in the context of the basic law, there are the Article 158. There are other, um, you know, other um, articles that may limit the power of the of the courts and, of course, of the judges when they are ruling on the cases. And as we have seen uh, in the past years, the five in the interpretations issued by the NPCSC, of course, some of them are in line with the procedures and in line with the basic law articles. But some of them, we know that they overturn judgments. They um, actually uh, they use a legislative interpretation approach uh, as what we are taught in, in the lectures. Um, we, we know that these are not compatible with the Hong Kong style or the Hong Kong approach or the common law approach. So we, uh, my perspective is that, is that although the judges are doing their job diligently or, or very um, prudently, they, the, the system itself and the, I have to say, the, the government and the regime will actually have some effects on, on the on the Hong Kong law and in the legal system, and that's one of the facts. But let let's put put, it, put aside the basic law issue. There are other unjust aspects, I would say, in my perspective, for including other unjust laws. For example, the uh, public order ordinance, the overly harsh ordinance, including rioting, including the system of letter of no objection. These are always criticized by the international community, and as judges, they have to apply these laws. So their hands are actually tied. Of course, I will say, um, I will also encourage my friends um, not to criticize the judges emotionally, but of course on, on a very rational basis and about their judgments. And my expectation is that sometimes judges, um, they have to showcase their independence uh, really carefully. For example, not to attend some political you know, um, circumstances that some, some of them, we, we have seen it before. And these are, I think, I think it's very reasonable doubts from the, from the crowd. So I think um, from the perspective of legal professionals and law students, we must understand why the society or why the community is, is, is doubting uh, judicial independence. And I would say it is not solely um, the respons responsibility of the judges, but the, all other um, stakeholders, especially the government, because they have the most power in hand. And they have all the systems, rules, laws, and interests uh, to serve. Thank you. Could I just add one point? I have already uh, mentioned in my opening remarks that uh, holding, upholding the rule of law is extremely important. And it's not just a question of judges themselves. Judges themselves do, of course, discharge their duties impartially, independently, and in accordance with law. There are other stakeholders uh, using Aaron's words. The government must respect the courts as well. They must not misuse the court system to further the government's own agenda. On the other hand, politicians should also bear in mind that they should be careful not, again, use the, the courts to further their political agenda because they couldn't get their political agenda through in the legislature. For example, they use the courts, like what is happening in the UK and other places. And it would be a sad day uh, if one day we see a public comment that the judges are, as in the UK in the Brexit, enemies of the people. So it support much just cannot be uh, just from judges themselves work doing their work and from lawyers, support has to be come from all stakeholders, the government, the public. And we hope, certainly hope the Central People's Government uh, can, can respect that as well, although they, they operate under a different constitutional perspective. So that may be a bit difficult. And that gives rise to the question of how the judges, uh, whether the judges or uh, powers of, of interpreting uh, the basic law um, uh, has any has any limits and so on, but that that is something that we have to grapple with. One country, two systems again. So it all goes back to that that same point. What sort of legal systems uh, that we want? And in terms of why rule of law is concerned, one aspect of it which I specifically want to highlight again is that 
Judges are there to tell you how they decide their cases in their written judgment. That's visible, tangible evidence, how they decide the case, the issues before them. So look at the judgments. Judges can be criticized. Of course they can be criticized. Like anybody, they can be criticized. But the criticism must be based on rational reasons and valid legal grounds, as opposed to, I don't like what you decide, and you're a bad guy. So judges are not immune from criticism. In fact, the whole reason why we have open justice, courts are open to everybody, is that judges are being judged. The whole process is transparent so that people know what is going on in the courts, and that is uh, important as well. So don't, don't just limit rule of law to lawyers saying judges are good. No, everybody will have to play their part, the government, the media, the public, the police. Everybody. Thank you. Those are the foundational questions. So we will uh, return, I'm sure, in the, in the in other questions. So let's move on to the second uh, two uh, questions. Uh, Jia you start. Question three. Uh, uh, oh, I'm, I want to speak here. So, uh, Aaron, I agree with you that uh, judge's hands are tied in many circumstances, especially if you look at the uh, technical way and the legal, you know, legal, legal technical way. So, but but it's, maybe it's not that time from a different perspective. If you look at, for example, in the uh, anti-mass law judgments, the Hong Kong court's uh, power of interpreting the basic law and constitutional review has been uh, shown in, in that cases, and uh, it's respected by the Hong Kong government. However, the judi judicial decision was uh, fairly dis uh, criticized by the mainland side. For example, the spokesman of the MPCSC legal office and uh, the Hong Kong and Macau office, Gong Ban, uh, so of the state council, uh, the, because the, they say that court's decision has been go against the higher authority of, of MPCSC. Uh, so some probation scholars even say that uh, MPCSC should issue another interpretation to diminish the, you know, Hong Kong court's power to do the constitutional review. So, uh, so my question is uh, because for for the Hong Kong court, it may be uh, in a difficult situation or dangerous to to uh, ruin that cases in in this way. So, uh, my question is, uh, so why why they would would want to do that? What they want to achieve in this, uh, I would say, the high risk game, uh, and uh, is there any strategy involved in this judgment? Yes, yeah, this is my question. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, there's uh, the question, uh, Joanna. Your question. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jia Jun. Uh, so we have a lot of discussion about um, judicial independence and. Um, I want to focus on one of the very controversial remarks by the NPCSC, which is about um, the Zhang Tiawei, spokesman of the Legislative Affairs Commission of the NPCSC. So he suggests that the power to declare a Hong Kong local law incompatible with the basic law rests on no other authority other than the NPCSC. So, uh, in Hong Kong, a lot of people respond to these remarks, apparently, uh, one of which is uh, our former CJ, Andrew Lee. He said this is quite um, surprising and alarming. And on the other hand, uh, also another CFA uh, former judge, Henry Litton, uh, he said, well, well, uh, they doesn't mean that. Uh, they just say they just left out the ultimate power, the word ultimate power. So he think. Uh, more optimistically. Um, so in light of the circumstances, what do you guys think about this comment um, um, in, in, in the context of uh, judicial independence? Yeah. So, so the question is, um, who is the guardian of our constitutional order? Uh, Hong Kong judges or MPC standing committee? Uh, <laughs> I think it's quite clear that Beijing has the power of final interpretation, and I don't think anyone is disagreeing with that. But I think it's also very, very clear that the Hong Kong courts have the power 
of constitutional review. Because if you look at Article 8, it clearly says that you know, no law, including the ERO, or any legislation or subsidiary legislation, cannot contravene the basic law. And the Hong Kong courts have the power to interpret the basic law subject to being overturned by the MPCSE. So until overturned, I think it's quite clear that the Hong Kong courts have the power to strike down a legislation that falls within the limits of Hong Kong's autonomy. And I think this is an issue of whether you can wear a mask in Hong Kong. And I believe this is an issue that falls within Hong Kong's autonomy. Can I just add a non-legal point to this all? Because a lot of this has to do with politics. Um, I learned this statement from the internet somewhere, that a pioneer spirit is never to think that a door is closed. And in law, there are many doors that are not closed, many points which are not certain. And we have to try to keep those doors open and try to persuade or by legal precedent establish the best case we can because that's part of our job and that is not to allow anything to go by default. And I think reason and uh, balanced argument are really the fundamentals of it all. But Underneath all of this, there is a lot of politics because the reason why I brought out a constitutional court is this. We don't have it. And if you look at the one country, two systems, there are obviously a lot of ambiguities here and there. And in the end, I think it, we will need to rely on the restraint from the Beijing government. And we would hope that they get it right in terms of what the one country, two system policy was set up to be. Uh, because we, we are powerless in terms of overturning Beijing. It's not even something that we consider. But Beijing has a lot of authority over us, and it's been made quite clear that they have ultimate authority, and not only that, that they have the final interpretive power over the basic law. So in terms of politics, we have to point out that we need to rely on their pragmatism and on their ability to restrain and not to overuse their authority. I compare it to a seesaw. If one side goes up, the other side goes down. And obviously, both sides have to try to maintain a balance somewhere in between. And I want to bring that point out because many things that we do are really not uh, on the law side. I hated it when ever so often the government would say to everybody, we cannot get into political negotiations or politi political solutions at this point. Let's put down the protests first. And not to enforce the law is against the rule of law. But we do have amnesty. We do have prosecution uh, discretion embedded in our law, and we have used it before. So sometimes uh, compliance with law is not the answer. In fact, the rule of law sometimes requires that we do not prosecute. So I want to make that point because I really think that the government is misleading people when they tell everybody all the time that let's stop the protest first, do nothing else, we must enforce the law, and that is the rule of law. I think that is a very narrow sense of the rule of law, and the law com compliance and enforcement is then made an excuse for that. So I think there's a lot of danger within our own community in terms of those who are in authority and interpreting it in a way that actually distorts the rule of law. So just going back specifically to the questions, uh, Zhao Jun, uh, you asked, well, what, what is the Hong Kong court trying to achieve in the anti-mask uh, this decision? And of course, that's a very funny question, right? Because it sounds like they have some kind of, uh, um, you know, some kind of uh, motive, uh, some greater you know, political uh, agenda. Uh, but if you read the judgment very you know, carefully, you know, what are they trying? To, well, they're just trying to answer these legal, very important legal questions, right? Uh, you know, making reference to. Hong Kong authorities, overseas authorities, uh, they're just trying to answer the questions according to law. Um, so it's hard to read any sort of uh, 
you know, any kind of uh, intention be, be beneath, uh, beyond that. Um, and uh, for Joanna's question about Mr. Zhang's uh, comments, of course, you know, one has to look at those in context. They were given, I think, just hours after the judgment came out. He was just the spokesperson for this uh, commission. Um, and one wonders how really official it is in terms of representing what the Standing Committee actually uh, uh, intends or, or believes. Um, I think what is telling, of course, is that in the appeal case, in the Court of Appeal, uh, government did not take this point. I mean, government could have taken this point, right? And, of course, set it up for an interpretation down the road when it goes to the Court of Final Appeal, uh, but they didn't. Uh, so, you know, I think one can only give very little weight to what was said. Uh, and I think it does uh, it show, of course, again, they could have stepped in with an interpretation like they did with the, um, uh, the oath uh, saga. Uh, but again, they didn't. So it looks like they're waiting for this litigation to sort of play itself out as contemplated uh, by Article 158. One short point. I suspect this is about time that Professor Fu gave us uh, some perspective from the constitutional uh, law uh, angle. Um, I just can't help, personally speaking, I do not profess to be a constitutional law expert. I just cannot, um, my, for myself, uh, uh, help but think that the, the comments from the Legislative Affairs Commission is highly, heavily peppered with the political aspect to it. Um, that, uh, that is relatively easy to understand. Under the mainland system, my limited understanding is that the courts are there to serve, serve the country, of course, but more, partic more particularly to serve the Communist Party, which is, of course, synonymous from the practical point of view with the central people's government. So under their constitutional system, the courts are relatively a lower hierarchy in the system. Whereas in Hong Kong, we have always been under the system where the legislature, the, the executive, and the judiciaries are more or less, we would say, uh, I wouldn't use the phrase separation of power, but they are roughly the, the, the same. They are not subordinate to each other uh, for that, uh, to, to, to that extent. So the, the perspectives are different, and I can see why they may want to make that sort of statement because the political uh, uh, interest takes uh, precedence over uh, the legal interest and the, and the rule of law as we understand it. Uh, so insofar as we in Hong Kong are concerned, that's why we see senior judges who say that well, it's alarming if they're literally true and Henry and in the other instances say that well, they left out the word ultimate. I'm, I'm not sure that there was uh, just left out. I'm not quite sure this intentionally left out or not. Uh, but that's his interpretation. But the point is, we can only do what we have to do, right? And do not, be, do not stop doing what we need to do, what we believe is right, uh, un unless we can't do it. I remember distinctly when I was uh, counsel for the government in the Zhang Feng Yun case, one of the cases that deals with uh, right of abode, where a uh, Chinese citizen who was in Hong Kong is born in Hong Kong, will automatically get right of a vote in Hong Kong, despite his parents are in Hong Kong unlawfully uh, at the time. I remember when the Court of Final Appeal decided uh, in the way they did, that is, they, uh, the, the child does have right of a vote if he is a, a Chinese citizen born in Hong Kong. The Legislative Affairs Commission actually issued a statement on behalf of the Standing Committee of the NPC to say the decision was wrong. You can actually check the record. They actually said that. But since it's a rough, basically an internal matter for Hong Kong, if you want these babies born in Hong Kong to, be, to have right of vote, it's your problem. It's fine with us. So they didn't make a song and dance about it. And so what do we do? We just press on and do what we do and just get on with life. And I, I think at the moment, at the very least, that is the way that, that I would suggest that we go ahead. We just do what we believe is right. Thank you. Um, anything to add from students who asked the question? Just a few short response. Uh, thank you for your, all, all of your answers. So the first one is, uh, I agree with Ms. Wu, there's a, very, uh, there's a tension between the MPCSC and, uh, and uh, 
the courts, um, especially you, you say it's a lot of the politics goes on, but in actuality, I think there's, a, there's one thing that's illegal, which is when there's a dispute arise between the MPCSC and, uh, and the court, there's a no court, I mean, no dispute resolution to, to mechanism whatsoever to, to solve their dispute. So this may be a legal question. We, 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 because if yeah, there's a dispute goes, uh, arise, arising between them, there's a no mechanism to solve them. And, and my short response to, uh, to Professor Simon Yang and, and others, I guess, uh, is, yes, uh, I think in, in this case, uh, the court may have the political agenda under the, the legal surface. And when you read the, how the MPCSC spokesman of the legal office respond, uh, you will see they are full of the political statement rather than the, you know, it's more than the legal, legal, legal argument from their side. There's a legal office, but they say in the political language. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think it's a good point to think, continue to think on. Thank you. Um, I also have something to add. Uh, so the reason why I want to join this panel uh, is not because just I am a law student, but also um, I am an ordinary young people. And, um, and ordinary young people just want to know uh, our destiny and uh, what would happen to one country, two system and um, uh, judicial independence. And I remember last week when Carrie Lam uh, went to LegCo for a Q&A session. And he said, as she said, um, one country to system would depends on whether young people like behave themselves or respect the uh, country. And what comes into my mind is that it should be the concerted efforts of many stakeholders, like what we have talked about uh, about judicial independence. It should be about government, the public, a lot of different stakeholders. And for young people, if we constantly um, feel that there are a lot of pressure and a lot of threats going on uh, that makes us lose faith on one country to system, it would also affect what how we perceive uh, our future. So that's why I have the question about one of the very controversial comments by um, like Chinese part. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I will come back to you now. Um, so yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I just have a very uh, mild and short comment on it. Um, I think we have to put an, these uh, discussions into context, like what um, the speakers have spoken, that uh, the a basic law and also the constitutional order of Hong Kong must depend on the self-restraint of the MPCSC and the Chinese government and also the nature of the legal system in China that they practice and they believe in socialist legality. It is merely a tool uh, of governance. It's not, it's not like in Hong Kong. And also, we have also heard about um, the NPCSC's power, the plenary power and the ultimate power. And I think it actually it points to a fact, and many of us has actually agreed, maybe, that one country, two system does not really work. After all these discussions, um, we, we know that there are many limitations. Of course, one country, two systems can work in principle, but in reality, we see that political agenda, political comments, um, and, and also initiatives have been, in. Um, I mean, in, instilled into the legal system of Hong Kong. So uh, we can't really practice one country, two system in, in, in the circumstances, in the reality. And that is why there are so many so-called violent acts. There are so many calls for independence. And I think we all have to look into the facts. And it is time for us not to, you know, like um, what my uh, counterpart has I just mentioned, my, my friend just mentioned, uh, not point our fingers to the so-called violent young people, but we think about who actually made these troubles, who act who really, you know, arose all these um, controversies. Thank you. I, th I think I need to exercise my uh, discretion in terms of uh, the number of questions. I need to pick and choose some questions. Uh, 
Uh, why don't we start with you again, Aaron? You have uh, question seven. Uh, it's related to what you uh, have just said. Thank you, Professor. Um, my question is that um, given the circumstances we, uh, we, we can see now, um, are legal protests including civil disobedience or the violent protests justified in the face of unjust laws and authoritarian government? And uh, that, that act also involved the question of who is the um, destroyer of rule of law. Uh, and I, I just want to highlight is that uh, we, we, we can perhaps focus on moral, morally justified aspect, because we know that legally they are not justified. Yeah, thank you. And Joanna, could you just do uh, with the question six? Yeah. OK. Um, this question is more about uh, our law school. Um, so we have the five demands, and one of which is uh, the amnesty. So Ms. Wu also mentioned that this is one of the sort of uh, peace-building exercise. Uh, but for our law school, um, we on one hand, we nurture the young talents. And on the other hand, we also claim ourselves as the guardian of the rule of law. So we are sort of in a very difficult position. Um, I just want to know, like, your ideas of uh, how we should think about this demand of amnesty. Yes. And start uh, with uh, Simon. Well, let me try to answer the easy question first. <laughs> you understand, Mike? Uh, I, I think the easier question is probably the amnesty one. Um, I'm just very happy to say that I think we have already started to do a number of things. The center has recently published a, a paper. Uh, by my uh, colleagues and uh, Dejik uh, and a visitor uh, uh, that we had uh, on amnesties, which got some attention. So uh, I think that was a, a useful paper to explain how amnesties can be compatible with the rule of law. Um, but if I could just say something about uh, uh, amnesties uh, uh, in general, I think perhaps the government and some of the pro-established people seem to be uh, very against amnesties uh, because they sort of see it as um, a kind of a wall that uh, the chief executive would be sort of, you know, laying down, uh, and almost sort of then uh, the effect of that wall would be to say everyone's exonerated uh, and no one, no one would be prosecuted. Um, I think that's to an ex too extreme version of amnesty, and it's probably more useful to think about two things. Uh, Anna's talked about the decision to prosecute and how the Secretary for Justice uh, has a public interest uh, criterion to decide not to prosecute. Yes, that's one thing. But I think even before that, even more important before that, is whether to actually charge the person and to investigate. It's, it's related. And, of course, that is within the realm of the police, right? Uh, and you don't have the problems with the basic law, Article 63, about prosecutions being free from interference. Because before, you've charged, before you have a prosecution, you have to charge them, right? So uh, I'm also very concerned about the effects of all these unrest in the past few months on our criminal justice system and the huge number of cases. It won't suddenly, it won't be like the UK and the Tottenham uh, 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 trials where they had to respond quickly because there was a huge influx of cases coming in. You know, I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's going to be an increase in the caseload over time, right? simply because things don't move as quickly here for different reasons. Right? But that's going to be uh, disruptive to our system nonetheless. And so I'm very concerned about that and how it can affect our institutions, whether it's the courts or prosecution. So what we need to have is, is ways to deal with that caseload. And, to, and one way that we normally deal with it is to have early resolution or to have things enter the system and exit the system quickly, or not to even enter the system at the beginning. And that's where charging comes in. And one idea that I'd like to leave with the audience is right now we have a scheme that the police can give you a caution if you are under 18 and you get involved in, in crime. It's known as the police superintendent's discretion. Right? But it only applies to people who are under 18. You have to admit the, uh, take responsibility. 
There has to be enough evidence to bring the charge. But the police will decide not to charge you and put you under maybe a scheme of supervision for two years, almost always with the cooperation of the parents. Right? So one question I would have for everyone here is, do you think it's a good idea that a scheme like this could be maybe extended or adapted to, um, say, other young, young adults, maybe people who are, un people who are under 25, uh, whereby the police could also exercise the discretion not to charge someone. But there might need to be some kind of arrangement whereby there could be some supervision uh, over a period of time. Um, and maybe that's one way. It's, it's, it, it's a kind of amnesty, possibly. But it would operate at the police charging stage. I think many people may have concerns about how aggressive the prosecutors have been in bringing prosecutions. And it doesn't seem like there's a lot of mercy or public interest right now. So maybe we can operate at the level of the police and at the charging stage. Maybe a scheme uh, could be uh, uh, introduced here uh, along these lines. So I'll say. Mr. Chair. I, I'm not a criminal law expert. I'm not an expert in anything, actually. Uh, but um, I have spoken to at least one former DPP who has suggested something very similar to what Simon has been talking about. Um, that is to deal with the, the uh, large number of case law and also the large number of relatively younger uh, I wouldn't say offenders, but young, younger people who have been arrested, put it that way. And um, the, the point ultimately is whether the DPP uh, considers that it is in the public interest to prosecute or not to prosecute. And that is a prerogative that I think uh, we should leave to the DPP uh, to exercise. Um, what I would mention here is that we are talking about um, possibly relatively minor cases. But we have seen some very serious violent crimes. And I, for, uh, on my part, would think that it would be against the public interest if we just give a blanket general amnesty for all those who are uh, involved in potential uh, violation of the law. A line has to be drawn somewhere. And I would think it would be wrong to uh, grant an amnesty at least for some of the more serious crimes. Uh, but that's my, uh, my personal point of view. Um, I don't know whether that uh, provokes uh, any response from others. Oh, no, I'm just going to address the question on civil disobedience because uh, the Hong Kong CFA has actually addressed this issue. And I'll just read out the key parts from that judgment, which I think everybody will be interested in. And it was decided in 2018. And, the, uh, the, the, and it was Secretary of Justice versus Wong Ji-Fong, and I think we all know who he is. All right? And this is what the court said. The concept of civil disobedience is one which is recognizable in any jurisdiction, respecting individual rights, including Hong Kong. To conform to civil disobedience as generally understood, therefore, the action carried out must be peaceful and non-violent where a protester commits an act infringing the criminal law which involves violence and is therefore not peaceful and, and not violent, a plea for leniency will carry little, if any, weight at all, since by definition that act is not one of civil disobedience. Then what the question is, what about peaceful civil disobedience? The court did not answer that question, but they cited a paragraph from Lord Hoffman, and I would like to read the paragraph they cited from Lord Hoffman, who said, In deciding whether to impose punishment for civil disobedience, the most important consideration will be whether it would do more harm than good. This means that the objector has no right not to be punished. It is a matter for the state, including the judges, to decide on utilitarian grounds whether to punish or not. Thanks. Uh, let, let's uh, move to the, um, uh, the uh, last. Uh, uh, can I just add a couple of comments to the issue of amnesty? Uh, because 
we touched on the issue of Secretary for Justice having the discretion, and that's actually in our laws under the Criminal Procedure Ordinance. The police is also subject to executive directions on what to do, and that's within the police uh, ordinance. There is general discretion in the prosecution code. Uh, and we see this exercised in other circumstances. We don't even uh, question it. For instance, if you have someone who is giving you useful information on tax fraud, and the government could produce Im uh, immunity for the witness or a blanket undertaking not to prosecute that particular person. So these procedures are actually in our law today. The question is when you exercise it. And that step has to be thought through because I don't believe in peace building not having a component of dealing with rifts. And these rifts are very deep. Uh, for instance, if you look at uh, vulnerable youths, I think that's one group that we should look at in terms of amnesty. We need to define uh, the kind of offenses that we'd like to give amnesty for. But if we don't look at the vulnerable uh, youths today, we're going to end up with a huge social cost later on. And we've got actually, and I would advocate this, and that is we look at the individual criminal liabilities of the police. I'm not talking about uh, institutional liability of the police, but some of the policemen, we need to look at potential individual criminal amnesty, in fact, and we have to look at the uh, classes of offenses that we should consider that for. Um, I don't, uh, I, I'm a proponent of amnesty, and I think there are groups that we should look, uh, look at amnesty for, and that includes some of the police offenses. Thank you. Let's uh, move to the final set of questions. Um, could I ask uh, Adrian to ask question A? Uh, so my question uh, is about the rule of law, the meaning of rule of law. So I actually agree with the speakers that uh, rule of law cannot be understood in the narrow sense, uh, in the narrow sense, which is just to comply with the law, as uh, rule of law also encompasses uh, meaning of uh, the lim limitations of the government power as well as uh, the protection of human rights. So, uh, but we are now seeing more uh, people are supporting uh, the violent actions of uh, the protesters, for example, the destruction of transport facilities, uh, the destruction of uh, mainland-related stores. So is this meaning that our Hong Kong youths are actually not supporting uh, the rule of law anymore? So if yes, is there anything that the legal field can do with it? Um, the final question uh, will be asked by uh, Aaron, uh, question 13, the last question. Uh, the last question is about uh, how do we you know, heal and move on. That um, what can we do in the future in order to protect the Hong Kong core values, including the rule of law, democracy, and freedom, which, is, which seemingly is not very sustainable under the current constitutional framework? Thank you. I don't want to answer those questions, <laughs> but I do want to ask questions. And that is, I've come across law students today who are telling me I don't want to continue studying law because they see 2047 as a deadline. They see encroachment uh, in the, uh, towards you know, independence of judiciary and so on and so forth. So my question is, why are we studying law? And what are our fears about the legal system? Because we really need to understand those aspects. Many of these issues are not strictly legal, and I think that it's come to the point that we really need also to think outside the box and to think about the wider law and not just the narrow textbook version of the law. So that's the, uh, a good opportunity to advance the uh, second dialogue. Yeah is the question, what's the future of legal education and legal profession in Hong Kong? 
So you are most welcome to come to join us for discussion. It will be uh, uh, right after Chinese New Year or uh, in the middle of February. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone want to uh, have a go on these questions? Okay. All right. I want to uh, respond to the question about rule of law and uh, what advice to the legal field or the law, or the law student. I think primarily directed at law students, because I know many students, of course, have you know, uh, been involved in the protests, uh, and uh, obviously many would be siding sort of with the protesters. But um, I think if you are a true believer in the rule of law, right, I would want to test that first. And I think the way to test that is that are you still, would you be committed to upholding the rule of law, whatever the consequences of the application of that law? Right? And you have to say yes to that. So even if it means that the application of that law would result in students being convicted of offenses, and punished, right? Um, and you still accept that that is the law, right? Uh, and that, I think, is the true test of the rule of law. I mean, as a practitioner, you know, you know sometimes you ask, well, how do you know you live in a rule of law society, right? And, you know, oftentimes it's actually not just winning cases, but losing cases you will see, right? And you read the judgment, you understand why you've lost. Uh, and you accept that. That's the law. And you, and you move on, I think, as Jetsu Tong has said. You carry on, right? Uh, that's the true test of, I think, rule of law. And that's the message that you have to convey. And I think that's what the Chief Justice has been saying. Don't, don't be drawing conclusions about whether there's rule of law simply because you don't like the result uh, of the case, right? You have to look at how that result was achieved. Yes, if there was unfairness, if there was something unlawful about that process, protest, uh, that process of reaching that result, then you can complain and you can feel uh, 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 aggrieved by that process. And hopefully, there's still a, a right of appeal. Um, so that's what I would say uh, about uh, rule of law and about uh, core values. Um, I'll just sort of mention uh, uh, this out of this faculty when my colleague Cora Chan is just. Uh, uh, published uh, an edited book on Article 23, National Security, and the title of that book is Resilience, right? I think that's a nice word that we, these days we need to think about resilience. How do we protect these core values and institutions? And that book, I think, has a lot of interesting insights uh, that you might want to consult. Uh, it's, been, it's published by Hart Publishing. It's, it's coming out very soon. I, I think I posed a similar question uh, when I began, is to say, looking forward, what type of system do you want? Uh, not just by 2047, um, but beyond. And a large part of what uh, we will get de really depends on what we uh, endeavor to fight for. And if we believe in the core values and the freedoms that we enjoy, and we want to protect and enhance these rights and freedoms, one of the best things you can do is to continue studying law, be a good lawyer, join the judiciary, and perhaps even be the next CE or a CE in the future, and to, res uh, to ensure that the rule of law is respected. It could be a CE, it could be a commissioner of police, it could be a chairman of the IPCC, whatever it is. But I find it very difficult to understand why would any um, person who, who is already doing law, for example, and say that I'm not going to study law anymore, I'm not going to know what it is. We're sharing a slightly, slightly different context, but the personal uh, story is that I studied law in the uh, mid-80s when we were having great uncertainties as to what the legal system was going to be post-1997. That was when China and UK were discussing uh, the framework for the future of Hong Kong, and there was no guarantee at that time, uh, some suggestions that the common law system should, re should remain, but there was uh, very strong views that uh, that should not be a different legal system. 
And those few years, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, applicants to law faculty here tend to be the ones who are uh, rejected by other faculties. And uh, there weren't many lawyers. And, um, but at that time, I took the view that, at least say in the Chinese saying, when there is a danger, there's always opportunity. Because uh, modern society cannot live without a legal system with lawyers and judges to support it. So whatever system it may be, uh, if you are there, you can take part and you can play a part in molding that system and making sure to the best of your ability that the system that you would accept, it may not be exactly the same as it is today, but what it is going to be depends on how, what you make of it. So uh, do your best to make sure that you have a contribution to that system and have a say. My view, I just answered the question about the future and core values, and my view is this, that a city that is unable to fulfill the hopes and aspirations of its young people will never have a future. But at the same time, I also believe that one can never bring glory to any city by setting it on fire. So, okay, yes. Can I just add to what Jess Yutong has just said? Unlike him, I was never a good student to begin with. And when I entered law, it was actually on the basis of going in and getting out as quickly as possible, but never to be a practitioner. Uh, and I never wanted to study law until I see law in action. And that is, you see the cross-section between law and society functioning. And you see the values and you see the changes that it could bring. So my answer to some of the students who had come up to me and said, I don't really want to study law anymore, is this, that look at the wider context of the law. And if you look at something like judicial review, look at that process, because there is a lot that hinges on authorities' accountability. And that is one key issue in Hong Kong. Now, there are students who also come to me and say, I'm taking a double degree, and I'll give you some of the uh, uh, discussions that I had with that particular group. I am taking business and law, politics and law, and so on and so forth. So automatically, I would ask, you know, why are you taking a double degree? And which side do you intend to go to, business or law or both? And I've been getting some answers which are troublesome. The answer was, I think I may not be able to get a, a, a lawyer's job. So I'm doing a, um, an insurance policy, studying business and law or politics and law. So if I'm ousted from the law, I can go and do business <laughs> or politics or something else. Um, so it, it's this kind of ambiguity which troubles me somewhat because I'm a believer in the law. I'm a believer in the um, greater use and the values of the law in society, not just the strict uh, legislations and rules that we have in the textbook. You want to add anything? Yes. Um, I think uh, just to answer Ms. Wu's question on uh, what am I fear of? I, I fear of Hong Kong's rule of law becoming rule by law or eventually it becomes rules only. So that's my fear. And we, we, we have seen it um, over the years, uh, the Hong Kong's conditions and the controls and also the, 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 the deterioration of one country, two systems. And that is why I, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I kind of worried about that. And the reason, I mean, after look, looking into the, the, the scenarios in Hong Kong, we, we need to fight on, of course, for rule of law and for justice, because justice must be served by the law, and that is the ultimate goal of it. But I would just like to, you know, give a very um, a rebellious comment on it. The people on the street who does violence, for example, they know what they're doing. They're not violence lovers, I would say, who doesn't like, who doesn't like to sit in, in a couch and look at the TVs uh, seeing the government being responsible, yes, yes, seeing them being responsible and, and uh, enjoy their freedoms and rights. 
who doesn't like it. I would say the people who took to the street, no matter they are just protesting or they are committing some so-called crimes, they have the views, the, the collective views to protect the rule of law and protect the one country two systems or the original Hong Kong um, system. And that is why I would, I, would, I would always say when we think about amnesty, when we think about um, condemning violence, we must not, uh, you know, lift our legs, in, uh, feet into the, into the air. We must take it, take it into context. The people in Hong Kong, the protesters, they fight against unjust laws and they probably do more than us. Like, we might, we might not, uh, a very simple example. If they didn't take to the street, if they didn't go to the uh, Lechko and siege the Lechko on June 12, what would it be now? We might not be here talking about it. We might not be here speaking with freedoms. So let us not be, you know, always think, think in theory. Let us think in realistic way and why they did it and and uh, what can we do for it? Of course, we have to fight on. And as lawyers, we, have, we, we must continue our fight in a legal system, in a legal way. And we must also understand um, the reasons behind those so-called violent acts. And our, our way to protect them or our way to prevent this violence is to end the irresponsible government and t take that back to the right path. And that is what we can do, but not just to condemn violence. And that's my message to to the CE, perhaps. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so on that note, I would like to close the uh, second part. Let's move to a Q&A session. We have about 20 minutes. So you have been sitting there listening to many of us. Now you have an uh, opportunity to make a comments, uh, pose a question to uh, one of the speakers on the stage. Yeah, maybe I can make a brief comment on the uh, debate about whether people will still want to study law, and then also if I could ask a question to uh, Jet Su Tong. Um, the, of the, so there certainly are students who um, recent events have caused them not only to um, re question whether they want to continue studying law, but sadly, in the case of where I work, to give up their legal studies altogether. So there certainly are students who are adversely affected in that way. But in my experience, and mine may not be typical, I mean, I I run course for adult learners, so it may not be typical of undergraduates. They're outweighed by the number of applications I receive from students who say on their personal statements, I have never thought about studying law until the events of last year, and the events of last year have made me, that's why I want to study law now. Um, so I don't think we should assume it's a one-way street. I mean, the events will affect different people in um, different ways, but there's certainly, it's a significant number of people it's affecting and making them think they'd be more determined to study law than before, which is surely a hopeful sign. Um, for Jet Su Tong, um, <laughs> I must ask because, I mean, um, there's so much, so much talk about the role of the IPCC in the last six months, and you, you really are in a unique position to talk about <laughs> the role of the IPCC, and it really would be, it would be great to hear a little bit about what you think. Uh, this is the sort of situation you never, never had, to, you had to contend with many things, but a situation you never had to contend with what the IPCC realistically can and cannot do in a situation like this, and perhaps even speaking hypothetically, what the role of the head of the IPCC should be, and um, whether it's appropriate even for a, a head of IC IPCC to change recommendations in a draft report. Thank you. I'm not going to respond to the comment in the first part. As for the IPCC, um, it's a difficult question to answer, but my, uh, from my perspective, and uh, I think we would have to look at it this way. The IPCC was not set up for investigations. It is a monitoring body to monitor the complaint handling process. Because of that, uh, we won't, won't go into the historic reasons why that was so, but because of that, the secretariat, the manpower to assist the council is limited to that monitoring role, to support the council in that role. And council members, of course, coming from all walks of society, would be, uh, would be making a decision as to whether the process uh, 
conforms to the standards that is required. Now, usually trans tries to transpose that sort of setup to an investigatory uh, or, or something of that nature is really putting a square peg in a round hole, in my view. And whether I can't speak on behalf of Tony, I know Tony very well. Uh, I can't speak on his behalf. But if I were the, the chairman, the first question I would ask is, why am, why am I, the IPCC, being asked to undertake this job uh, with the powers that we have under the statute, which is to uh, review the procedures uh, of the police as to what, actually, how those procedures are actually deployed on a particular occasion or particular occasions. And when my secretariat, um, my, my resources are not set up for that purpose, how am I going to discharge those duties uh, to, the, to the satisfaction of the public? And remember, when the IPCC prepares a report, of course the report goes to the CE, but it's really for the public. It's really for the public. It's not just for the CE to, to read when she has nothing else to do, which seems to be the case at the moment. But um, the IPCC is, uh, in my view, unfairly criticized because it has been put in a position of no win. Because whatever it does is not going to do what the public wants, wants uh, as, as a demand. At the same time, it is not able even to provide what the government uh, uh, wants it to do and is not designed for that purpose. So the IPCC, uh, a lot of my former IPCC members have this sense that the IPCC has been used in this way. Uh, I wouldn't use any other verb for that, for that but just used in, in this way unfairly. And, and in that sense, it's unfair to the IPCC and which is sad for uh, a former chairman. Um, I was telling a number of the, uh, of the audience here and some of my former IPCC members, I think one of them has already left. Uh, he's had too much of me. Uh, but uh, it was actually in this very building six, seven years ago when I retired from the IPCC in a public forum uh, that we discussed. And I was saying, advocating that my uh, successor should start thinking of negotiating with the government to enhance the powers of the IPCC in particular, whether they should have some form of investigatory power into at least serious cases or cases of great public concern. Because that's the time to do it. When things were peaceful, four months later they were occupied. But anyway, th there's another story. But at that time it was peaceful. And the IPCC has, um, uh, I'm grateful to the public, have some public support and we had a reasonably good reputation as being a good spokesperson really for the whole system and helping the police to, to enhance their uh, credibility in the eyes of the public. And this is at that time, in a peaceful time when you have to start doing this. Once trouble begins, it's too late. And unfortunately, what I've said five, six years ago exactly happened, materialized. I warned, I think also, um, on the day before I left, I went for an interview, and I say that the police, the, the relationship between the police and, and the public has reached the point of uh, critical point. And steps must be taken to ensure the police is not placed as the fulcrum of the storm, of the eye of the storm, when things happen. Uh, unfortunately, that, again, that warning hasn't been, hasn't been taken up. But, um, uh, so the IPCC is, is not really tasked for that. And I feel sad that it has been, it has been asked to, to do whatever they have been asked to do. And you can see that the overseas experts, having gone into this, realize that they can't actually do it and, as, as well. And, and you see that saga. And now you have the question of the credibility of the IPCC uh, being attacked uh, unnecessarily, in my view. Um, it doesn't seem to me that what the IPCC is doing, whatever they may be doing, will satisfy the public or even satisfy the government. So it, it, it is a sad episode. Um, as ex IPCC chairman, I, the only thing I can say is that, um, the only good thing that I can say is that I'm not in the chair. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, I hope to ask a question not as a CCPL staff, but as an, just another youngster uh, born and raised in Hong Kong, whom, uh, according to Carrie Lam, actually has 
uh, no stack in our society, uh, but I'll, I'll ask the question anyway. Um, one of the slogans that have been chanted by protesters in Hong Kong through the streets in recent months is liberate Hong Kong, revolution of a time, uh, and my question is, in, in times of revolution, borrowing uh, words from Simon, is it really possible to be true believer uh, in the rule of law? Um, and more importantly, it's it, isn't it more important to be true believer in justice than in rule of law in times of you know military uh, military or militant revolution? Because I think to some, the term revolution should be taken literally, meaning a overthrowing the government of, of either in Hong Kong or Beijing through violent and military means. So in times of that, whereas there's hardly any law anyway, so is it more important for us to be a true believer in, in justice? And may I just add a point that most of the freedoms and rights that we have enjoyed nowadays, if we put things into a greater scheme of things, are actually brought upon by revolutions and, and violence. I mean, if you look at French Revolution, American revolutions, and, and to a certain extent, uh, which interestingly was carried out by um, alumni of this very university, uh, Sun Jong San. Uh, some, most of the rights that we enjoy nowadays are actually bought by fallen means. So I was wondering what's, what's your take on that, especially as a legal community? Let me just make one comment. Um, what is justice, right? Uh, I don't think many people will be able to agree on what is justice. But what is the law? I think most people uh, would be able to agree on what the law is. So you have a standard that um, is universal or uniform that we can apply. And, and that's you know, the beauty of the rule of law. It, and it's the law that gives us freedom. Right? But everyone has their own subjective conception of what is justice. That doesn't give us freedom or doesn't protect our rights. Um. Um, I don't necessarily interpret the expression of liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our times in the context of a revolution, physically. But I think giving it, I have been giving it a lot of thought in terms of what are the qualities of life that we want to have redeemed. Uh, and if you start thinking about those aspects, and it's a different kind of revolution that we're talking about. It is not a physical revolution. What we do have a problem with today is lack of accountability of government, bad governance, no universal suffrage. That's been commented upon you know, for years, and there has been no change. So I see those as problems. But recently I've been very much in discussion with peace builders all over the world. And they tell me that many of the uh, areas in conflict, they will not be resolved by further conflict. In fact, it will bring further misery to those places. Nobody will be able to get out of that misery if we have struggle versus more struggle and dueling forever. We just won't have the time to go and build a community. And so if you talk to these peace builders, they uh, thinking is many of the conflicts in the world today are settled through peaceful resolution and therefore peaceful dialogue. And that is a skill that we have to learn to deal with both in Hong Kong for small and big things. Because our government doesn't understand what is listening <laughs> to begin with. So you need to listen and you need to come up with solutions, political solutions, not to offer a stalemate of dueling to say that there are protests out there, I cannot produce a political solution, to me it's a stalemate. In fact, to that extent, I think it is also unfair to the police because they've been caught in this issue. It's not their issue, it is a political issue. And so that's part of the reason why I would support a partial amnesty for the police as well. But we have to get out of this problem not through the encouragement of struggle versus struggle. I think it has to be a, a peaceful dialogue and the government has to understand and must learn the skills of a dialogue. And that includes inclusiveness, greater representation, and looking for common values. 
not looking through looking not looking at these issues as points of struggle it is not a struggle we should get ourselves out of that you know on both sides really okay. i have a question about uh, amnesty especially in light of what we heard about the ipcc um, just now and in particular i would like to see if we can address the issues of fairness and um, motivation to engineer an amnesty um, I find it a mistake, a disgrace even, that we did not even attempt that five years ago um, and instead pursued more of a path of vengeful um, action against those deemed to be opponents or enemies. But I am actually less optimistic about that at this particular moment. At least five years ago, there were the Tat Gang and Ju Sir. Today, we have 7,000 arrested on one side and few even suspended from duty let alone um, investigated or charged on the side of the police. If we do not have, if we have such extreme asymmetry on two sides of the battle, why would the government, why would the police care to entertain the idea of amnesty? I, I do agree with you, Anna, that uh, we should grant some partial amnesty to the police. But isn't that predicated on your first point, which is to do some fact-finding and investigations? And if the IPCC is not uh, equipped to do that, should we start with that and then at least engineer enough incentive for the government and the police to at least come to the table and work on a peacemaking, um, I don't know, compromise uh, and uh, dialogue um, and engendering um, conversation about amnesty? Can I, can I just very quickly respond to that? Because uh, I started today's discussion on my part with three things. The first thing was actually truth-seeking, and that is where the Commission of Inquiry comes in. I think that is essential because, to put it plainly, unless we have truth-seeking and getting down to what factually occurred, what caused it, and where the responsibility lie, we will not have closure to this issue. So that is my number one component and the number one step. The second step, which should follow very closely because I don't think we can afford to continue having struggle versus struggle, is to have some degree of amnesty being considered. I think the vulnerable, the young generation in particular, is important to us. And the, uh, I, I looked at the police side because they've been caught in this as well. And to be practical, unless we think about amnesty for individual criminal liability for the police, with regard to certain types of offenses, they will not go away. Uh, so that is a matter of pragmatism. The youth, I think, in terms of the future, we have to give them some degree of hope. The third aspect is what we all touched upon, and that is the discussion on reform, the discussion on common destiny. Unless we have that, we just don't know what we're doing together as a community. I mean, it may sound spiritual, but <laughs> That's a fact of life. We need to know where we're going. Yeah. So on amnesty, I guess what I was trying to say is I think maybe we should move away from the language of amnesty. Um, it just seems like it's not that helpful. And that because, as I said earlier, amnesty implies um, it's a statement from the top saying that you were never wrong in the first place. So you, you, know, you didn't commit any wrong. Um, it can be interpreted in different ways. It might be interpreted in that way. So what I'm saying is that if you don't clarify the meaning, it might be misinterpreted as saying that you didn't commit any wrong. And that sounds like it might be contradictory to the rule of law. What I'm saying is move away from that language and focus more specifically on the actual public law decisions that have to be made, whether it's the decision to charge or the decision to prosecute. And as I said, there is, this, there is already a police scheme whereby if a, a young person under 18, they admit that they committed the offense, right? then there is a discretion in the police not to charge that person. But it starts with admission of wrongdoing and the agreement to be under a scheme of supervision. Right? Perhaps a similar kind of scheme could be devised and it would have the practical effect as an amnesty, right? Depending on how the term, 
how the terms are defined. Um, maybe that's a more sort of concrete uh, uh, and practical way of moving forwards where you effectively get the same results as an amnesty. You can also work at the level of the prosecution, a scheme for exercising the discretion not to prosecute on the basis of public interest. If you look at the prosecution code right now, the, the, what it says about public interest is somewhat vague. It's, it's just a list of criteria. One could maybe give some more form to that and to have a pro, a, perhaps a kind of a scheme whereby if it meets a certain criteria, then you exercise the public interest not to prosecute. Um, but I'm thinking, why not start this right at the beginning at the, at the stage of charge, right? Uh, and that could be done maybe even in conjunction with universities and schools, because there's this element of supervision. Maybe schools can also be involved as well to provide some degree of supervision. The LB student as the final word. Um, I think in, in, in response to the MST problem, I think one of the points that uh, Professor Yang and also the paper by CCPL actually made a very good point on conditional release, that um, it can serve the function to recognize the, the crimes or the wrongdoing, and at the same time has, has the effect of, a, of an amnesty. So it actually is the concerns of the public that um, the people, I mean, the wrongdoer or the offenders may may um, may evade from any uh, kind of recognition of liability. So I think this is one of the things. But at the same time, I think um, I and also many of the protesters may disagree on amnesty for the police. The reason is that I think we must look at the intentions and motivations behind the commission of the offense. If the intention was just to pursue um, political or, or what we call um, political goals or to uh, in defense of the um, unjust government government uh, doing of course this has to be uh, seek uh, the truth must be uh, investigated before we assert anything like this if that is if that is the case but not for the personal gain then of course they should be entitled to amnesty but at the same time why am I saying that some police officers should not be entitled to it? Because their motivations might be really criminal. They're, 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 they are doing it for their personal gain or, or for intention to harm. For example, the excessive force while arrest. If they can prove that it's reasonable, of course they will not engage in any criminal, criminal liability. But if not, then they should bear the responsi responsibility. And some are like sexual harassment, rape, or even like shooting live rounds unnecessarily. How, like, how can we accept this kind of amnesty? This is p solely not for uh, societal interests. But on the other hand, of course, some of the protesters may did some criminal acts for personal gain. Of course, these, these are the cases that we have to look into. But for the others who did it for societal interests, I think that's, that's very reasonable for us to ground amnesty. And of course, there are, in this paper, there are many uh, conditions and also versions that we can um, refer back to. And I think uh, we have to look into this uh, very closely. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, uh, time is uh, really up. I have to bring the session to a, a conclusion. So uh, thank you very much for participating in this uh, dialogue. As I said, that's the beginning of the beginning of a series of a dialogue. I um, uh, thank you for participating in this event, and uh, I hope we can see you in the uh, near future. So uh, thank you. Do you have an announcement to make? Oh, yeah. Members of the audience, we have prepared a cocktail reception for you on the first floor. So just join us downstairs on the first floor. Thank you. <laughs>